Welcome to the 19th IISS Manama Dialogue in the Kingdom of Bahrain. It is an honor to open this dialogue in my new capacity as Executive Chairman of the IISS, and it is a source of additional pride to me that my successor as Director General and Chief Executive, Dr. Baskin Gigrik, won a global competition for the role, having worked for many years in the senior management of the IISS. I can assure this audience and our many friends throughout the region who could not be with us today that there has not been regime change at the IISS. We know how to divide our labors and how to join forces. The result will be widened executive leadership at the IISS that will ensure our unique strategic culture is maintained. We will become even more effective in generating data, producing analysis, and exerting influence on the key issues of war, power, and rules for our core international constituency of government, the corporate sector, and the expert and opinion-forming communities. We shall do so with our international staff from an international perspective and with international reach. The IISS Middle East Office in Bahrain, the Manama Dialogue, will continue as vital generators of data and ideas that contribute to more detailed understanding of geopolitical and geoeconomic issues and therefore more astute diplomacy and international policy. It's useful to recall the origins of this IISS Manama Dialogue and of our presence here. It started with a conversation I was fortunate to have with His Highness the Crown Prince of Bahrain in London early this century. I noted that then, occasionally, leaders, foreign ministers, defense ministers, and national security advisors from the Middle East would speak in Western capitals, and sometimes Europeans, North Americans, and Asians would come to the Middle East for talks. However, there was no institution in the Middle East where the voices of the region had an annual platform to project their strategic thinking to a wider audience. His answer was, great idea, talk to our foreign minister, who was then Sheikh Mohammed bin Mubarak Al Khalifa. A year or so later, the IISS Gulf Dialogue that became the IISS Manama Dialogue was born. Every worthy ambition begins with a conceit. It was perhaps a conceit that we could aim to gather in the Middle East the security establishment of the region under our auspices. But it worked and this dialogue has continued to grow. Our high ambition for this summit persists, and we will be fully celebrating it at the 20th anniversary dialogue held here next year. This must persist as the essential platform for dynamic diplomacy on Middle East security. We live in an age of thinking tactically. This dialogue was established to sustain the art of thinking strategically. I want to thank His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa bin Salman Al Khalifa and His Royal Highness Prince Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa, the Crown Prince and Prime Minister, for their vision, their trust, and their unflagging commitment to the IISS to work here in Manama to advance and support the cause of international peace and security. But how sad that this year we meet in such tragic circumstances. A horrific terror attack by Hamas on 7 October, resulting in an Israeli decision to pursue a maximalist goal to eliminate Hamas that in turn may risk further escalation involving other states and other non-state actors. The Middle East moved from a process of diplomatic reconciliation, military de-escalation, and new forms of economic cooperation to a dramatic revival of terror tactics, disastrous war, humanitarian catastrophe, and even new sources of rage that may have generational effects. Shuttle diplomacy by Arab states, Europeans, Asians, Africans, and others has been exercised at an unprecedented pace. International communiques are being signed, summit declarations made, UN resolutions debated. Meanwhile, non-state actors are overtly testing state tolerances for their narrow aims, and big states are deploying force to the region to contain a multiplicity of threats. 
The United States is now in the strange strategic position of having simultaneously to deter Iran from escalating and deter Israel from escalating. And to deter Iran, it may have to deter Israel. And to deter Israel, it must deter Iran. Dynamic diplomacy is now required to create the conditions for a more stable outcome. When multilateral organizations are too large or too slow, it is vital that a coalition of the willing be formed to address at the speed of relevance urgent matters. In my personal view, there is a specific issue that key countries must address which we should discuss at this dialogue. There is a need to begin somehow to compose an administration in waiting for Gaza that can assume authority once the war ends. And to end the war early, the shape and composition of that administration must be seen to be believed and once believed, take over. All this is happening at a time when leaders in this region are assessing the risks and opportunities of strategic diversification, hence the theme of this 19th dialogue. As I've said before, moving from non-alignment to multi-alignment can be wise. Better to have many friends than only a few. Depending on only one supplier of security and defense can be risky. Strategic hedging is a natural choice in an uncertain world. But strategic hedging, rather like financial hedging, requires active portfolio management. Political investments can turn sour. The value of certain asset classes can shift. Right now, Russia's strategic currency is in free fall. Soon, some countries will realize that they are perhaps a bit overweight Russia and will need to adjust their strategic portfolio accordingly. Others will decide that deepening trusted relationships, rather than widening experimentally to others, is a safer strategic investment. Small countries must be especially canny in the management of their relationships. Therefore, it's splendid that I can introduce the Crown Prince and Prime Minister of Bahrain as our keynote speaker this evening. His Royal Highness is leading the government here supported by Team Bahrain, a group of the best and the brightest, committed to working at speed and with sometimes stunning effect. The country's approach to the COVID-19 pandemic was exemplary, professional, and efficient. Under the fiscal balance program launched in 2018 to achieve a balanced budget, Bahrain has introduced taxes, reformed subsidies, and reined in spending. Bahrain's 2023-24 budget expects a budget deficit of less than 1% of GDP in 2024. Labor reform has picked up pace. Bahrain has embarked on several strategic projects to stimulate the economy. A new airport, a state-of-the-art amphitheater, a sixth line of production at Bahrain's aluminum smelter Alba, making it the largest smelter outside of China. It has embraced new technologies in all fields, including government delivery. Bahrain and the United States signed a Comprehensive Security Integration and Prosperity Agreement, CSIPA, on September 13, 2023. It affirmed the desire of both sides to expand their defense and security cooperation, trade and investment ties, and collaboration in science and technology. It signaled the commitment to work together to help deter and confront any external aggression against the territorial integrity of any of the parties. As the first agreement of its kind in the region, the CCPA is an important milestone in U.S.-Bahraini relations. It could constitute a model for deepening U.S. relations across the region. These were all strategic decisions. The content of good strategy is assured by the way in which strategy is conceived. Bad strategy that is conducted with a hot head and a cold heart inevitably leads to misfortune. Good strategy can only be crafted with a cool head and a warm heart. We have such a strategist with us today. He insists that accurate data be the source of informed decisions, has made empathy his guiding principle, good governance his mission, and savvy execution the inspiration for further ambition in the service of his nation. In other words, he is a leader. Your Royal Highness, the floor is yours.
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Your Highnesses, Excellencies, distinguished guests, welcome. Welcome to you who have come from inside Bahrain. Welcome to you who have come from all over the Arab world and the region. And welcome to you who have come incredible distances from the United States, from New Zealand, from all corners of the earth. We're very grateful you are here. There has never been a more urgent time for us to collaborate and coordinate. Uh, Dr. John Chipman, thank you so much for that introduction. It uh, warms my heart. That was 20, nearly 20 years ago that we spoke uh, in, in London. And what has been built over the years has been a wonderful um, tribute to all of the great thinking, the minds, the challenges uh, that the world has faced over this very um, interesting, uh, but I think fundamentally uh, transformative time. We uh, were right in the middle of the peace dividend at the end of the Cold War, entering into the new world order where countries had broken, new vacuums were created, September the 11th was still on people's minds, to where we are today, uh, pre-COVID, I would say, potentially with a fully functioning international order that has suddenly, after COVID, looked a little bit shaky. So, without further ado, I had accepted to speak um, before October 7th. And my subject matter that I was going to speak about was the global, global rules-based order and I was going to specifically discuss CSIPA and all of the great benefits and all of the uh, dangers that associations and integrations such as that will play going forward in the international community. Well, October 7th happened. So now that the war is raging in, in Gaza, that must take precedence and I must speak on it. It is a tough job and many speeches have been given about the situation uh, uh, as it stands today. I had the honor of delivering Bahrain's speech uh, at the Islamic Conference in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, ably organized, I must say. And this speech is going to be slightly different. And this is not a positional speech with a regurgitated copy that keeps repeated, being repeated over and over again. So forgive some colorful language, potentially. Forgive some interesting language, potentially. But when I say it's a tough job, it can't be as tough as living under the constant bombardment of bombs in Gaza today, with no running water, no running sewage, no internet, no phones, and the lack of surety if you're going to wake up tomorrow or if you're not. This is an intolerable situation, and we must do everything in our power to stop it. Now, both in Islam and Judaism, the protection of innocent life is a duty and a moral responsibility. In the Quran, it says that the killing of an innocent, one and an innocent is clearly defined, defined as one who has not spread corruption in the land or committed murder, is akin to killing all of mankind. And in the Abrahamic faith, the saying is to save a life is to save all of mankind. How wonderful. Now, both sides in this conflict haven't lived up to that. And I think our condemnation must be to both. I condemn Hamas unequivocally. This is so everybody in the room can understand that I stand on the side of civilians and innocence and not on the side of political posturing. The attacks on October 7th were barbaric, were, um, how can I put it? They were horrific. They used, they were indiscriminate. They killed women, children, elderly, did not matter. They hit civilian institutions and they hit military targets. And on top of that, it seems it's okay now to grab hostages and take them away and speak about it as if it's an act of war. 
That is something that we condemn. And we condemned it on October the 9th, I believe, or 8th. Now, Israel. I unequivocally condemn the air campaign that resulted in the death of over 11,000 people in Gaza, 4,700 of which are children. Now, both of these actions have led to the death of innocents. Both of these actions did not save the entirety of mankind, and in effect, are the equivalent of killing all of mankind. Both are reprehensible, both must stop, and both are, um, are a thing that we must deal with with the greatest care moving forward, because what we need to do is to break this cycle. And let me speak a little bit prescriptively about how I think this can be achieved. Two of the most important things we must do today are to get the hostages out. And in order to do that, we have read in open source that uh, the state of Qatar is working alongside with its partners in the United States and in Israel and with Hamas to release hostages. In exchange, we read, this is not corroborated, for prisoners who are also held within the state of Israel. Now, this is to release women and children on both sides, non-combatants, innocents. And this, I believe, is one component of what will achieve a break in hostilities. You want to call it a ceasefire, you want to call it a pause, you can call it whatever you want. The intention is a break so people can take stock, people can bury their dead, um, People can uh, finally start to grieve. And maybe people can start to ask themselves about the intelligence failure that led to this crisis in the first place. But let's get to that later. And the second thing that I think is needed is for the role of international law to be fully implemented in the conduct of war. And that is to allow the access of humanitarian aid. We have seen what has happened at the Shifa Hospital, Al-Quds Hospital, name it. Any facility that is caring for the weak, the young, and the, and, the, and the sick. We need to be sure that we can provide them with medicine. We need to be sure that we can provide them with fuel so that they can run their machines, their incubators. We need to be providing the people of Gaza with food. And I genuinely believe that the only way to achieve this is to achieve this hostage trade as soon as humanly possible. So from this stage, I call on Hamas to release the hostages, the women and children who, the, who they hold hostage in exchange, and I call on the Israelis to release the women and children they hold in exchange so that we can get some sense and a few days or weeks or months or maybe years of peace and calm. I don't think any Arab leader has called on Hamas to release the hostages. So it is a time for straight talking. It is a time where political positioning and actually the perpetuation of poisonous narratives, opposing narratives, must no longer be our methodology. We're all here to end this war. I don't care who started it. I don't care who will end it. I care that we all work together to make sure that it ends as quickly as possible. So, building on that, we all know that this conflict didn't start on October the 7th. This latest escalation did, but the conflict has been an ongoing uh, open wound in the Middle East for the past 80 years. And here's the kicker. No real security will ever be realized until a real two-state solution is found. So preserving this path to peace will demand strong leadership from us in the region and primarily from uh, the great powers and specifically from the United States. I be we believe that the United States is indispensable in leading this process. So if that is the case, let's try and draw some red lines, somewhat along the lines of the Tokyo Declaration, 
And let me be extremely clear what matters to the Kingdom of Bahrain. There must be no forced displacement of Palestinians in Gaza, now or ever. There must be no reoccupation. There must be no reduction in Gaza's territory. And on the other side, there must be no terrorism directed from Gaza against the Israeli public. So that is very clear. Those are the red lines. And central to this, central to finding that two-state solution, is that the Palestinian people's hopes and aspirations must be at the center of any post-crisis governance. In the immediate aftermath of the war, conditions must be set to deliver elections. This is something President Mahmoud Abbas called for at the Islamic Conference. This is a key demand. And the Palestinian Authority is the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people today. Listen to what he's saying. Elections will lead to, that lead to a strong, unified leadership across Gaza and the West Bank that can deliver hope and prosperity to the Palestinian people for, for years to come. And not only that, this organization, this process, must lead to a serious interlocutor and partner in delivering a just and lasting peace with a viable and independent Palestinian state as its goal. Also, deliver security and stability to its Israeli neighbor. Now, failing all this and allowing the base rules of war to govern the outcomes here in the Middle East will only increase a very worrying trend I have seen on the international stage. And that is the erosion of the rules-based order. This is something that I have, I was going to speak about. This is now actually putting it even to sharper focus. Military conflict or use of force cannot be the final arbiter in international disagreement. Diplomacy and international law must win. This stands here in Gaza and the Palestinian and the aspirations of Palestinian people, stands in Russia and Ukraine, stands in any other geography where people may fight over territory. And if we allow these institutions to erode, then I promise you what you're seeing in Gaza will just be the beginning of powerful states imposing their will on weaker states, and nothing will stop it spreading until we are in a conflagration that consumes a great proportion of the world. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm not one to speak for too long. I think I've been extremely clear. The abhorrent, abominable situation that the civilians of Gaza are existing under right now is something that I cannot in good conscience just let slide. We have to do everything in our power to prevent this. And that means working across lines, political lines, working with all of the parties involved to make sure that our voice, our reason, our best wishes for everybody get through. And I'll leave you with one image. There is a, uh, there's a worrying concern I have, which is the Russian invasion of Afghanistan created um, Al-Qaeda. The invasion of Iraq allowed ISIS to flourish in the vacuum. Think what this will create in the age of social media. Not only do we risk the abject um, a misery of a whole population, but we are creating the conditions for acts of violence to spread all over the world. And failing that, failing the, our, our inability to stop it, so encouraging them to, to do those things that need to be done to stop the war, I think we will be looking at a far more difficult next 20 years. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time to listen, and I wish you all the success in changing the narrative. Thank you.